Granny United, how's everybody doing today? Welcome to church this weekend. So glad to have everybody on all of our campuses. I love what God is doing in our church. You heard, haven't you, that last weekend there were 20 families, 20 people that were baptized representing all of our campuses. Can we just put our hands together no matter where you're at? This is absolutely incredible. The stories that we heard were phenomenal. We heard stories of God's unfailing and unconditional love, stories of restored hope, new life, new beginnings. We heard stories of addictions being broken by the grace of God. I mean, I'm telling you, it was absolutely incredible. We saw people baptized in our Haverhill campus, our Lawrence campus, our Salem campus, our Salem Sunday campus, and how awesome was it, I campus, to see people baptized baptized from your campus last weekend. I'm telling you, absolutely incredible. And I know you're all clapping everywhere, but I want us to all celebrate together. So on the count of three, let's put our hands together for what God is doing at Granite United Church. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, church. Put your hands together. Amen, 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 and amen. Hey, there's something else I want you to know, because I know a lot of you coming out of last weekend, out of the message, you're like, man, all right, now I understand what biblical baptism is. I really wasn't too sure about it, but I would like to take that step myself. Well, you are in luck because on April 3rd, on the count of three, let me hear everybody say April 3rd. Ready? One, two, three. April 3rd, we're having another baptism service. So if you haven't been biblically baptized yet, you are in luck. Grab that communication card, fill it out, drop it in the mailboxes in the back of your services. You're on the iCampus, one of our hosts, putting the link right now in the chat. Just take a screenshot, go, go there after we're done here, and we love to see you get baptized as well. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hey, we've been doing a run through through the book of Malachi. And so far, what we've learned in the book of Malachi, and although there's so much theological depth in this book, we've been looking at how important relationships matter to God, how important relationships are to God, that relationships matter to God. And today we're going to jump into chapter two. Somebody say chapter two. Jump into chapter two, and we're going to be talking about the family relationship and how important family relationships are to God as well. Now, here's what I know. I know that every one of us on all of our campuses, we all care about having a healthy, vibrant, God-honoring family. Can a brother get an amen? I know that. I know that about our church. And I'm talking about a close-knit, loving, caring family, one where we create memories, where we're happy to be together, where we're enjoying each other's company, and, and these memories that last not only for a moment but for a lifetime because, you know what, relationships matter. They not only matter to us, I want you to know they matter for God. And, and here's the deal. I know we want to have great relationships for a lifetime, but here's, here's what I want you to know. God wants something more. You say, wait a minute. What does God want? How can you have relationships that last for a lifetime, but then God wants something for more? Because relationships, as far as God are concerned, should have an eternal focus, not just a temporal focus. Focus, And so I want you to know there's more. There's another, another level that the Bible... And we're going to see that in the book of Malachi. A level that goes beyond having a, go a good family to creating and having a godly family. That really does enjoy the here and now, but we're also focused on the when and then, knowing that, man, eternity hangs in a balance, and I want my family not only to enjoy each other now, but I want my family to be able to embrace and look forward to forever. Somebody say amen. I'm telling you, this is awesome. And in Malachi, God has something to say about having this kind of family. He really does. This family that lasts beyond a lifetime. So... If we rewind, rewind the tape a little bit, if we remember what chapter 1 taught us, we learned that God was not happy with the priests and the leadership uh, because what we learned was as goes the shepherd goes the sheep. And we understood that we understand from Malachi chapter 1 that what was going on in the temple was kind of bleeding over into the homes and the families of Israel. And it was breaking the heart of God. 
God because God set up this system. He set up this system of religious uh, 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 leadership inside of the church where the leaders in the church, the leaders in the temple would teach the families who attended the temple how to have had to have a family that honored God and brought not only glory to God, but joy to their families. And, and so as all of that was getting messed up, man, it was breaking the heart of God. And we also know what the leadership was doing in moderation, the sheep. You know, as the shepherd was doing something in moderation, the sheep were doing in excess. And God was not happy. As goes the leadership, whether it's in the church, the temple, the church, or in our homes, so go the sheep, and so go the children and grandchildren, and possibly generations to come. And I want you to know that God has an expectation. He has an expectation. He has a desire. You know what God's desire is? Not get somebody next to you, but that we would have a godly home. So on the count of three, do me a favor. Look at somebody next to you, and I want you just to say to them, a godly home. Ready? One, two, three. A godly home. Okay? Because a lot of us are striving to have a good home. A lot of us are trying to have a great home, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there is that next level. Or as we say at Granite United Church, there's a whole nother level. And that is going from good to godly. And I also want to remind you of something else that we learned. We learned that we are part of a royal priesthood, that when you said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, you also became a spiritual leader, a a, a royal priesthood, as 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 told us. And so all of this, all that was specifically and directly speaking to Israel, talking to the priests and the leadership of Israel and the children and the sheep of Israel, it is applicable to all of us as children of God. So let me ask you a question. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. If you're excited about it, come on, somebody, put your hands together and celebrate the goodness of God in your life. I campus, throw some, some clap emojis there in the comments because I know you're excited too. And so we come now to chapter 2 in Malachi. And chapter 2 in Malachi talks about what godly leadership, both in the church and in the home, is supposed to look like. So we're going to do some reading here today. Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. Listen, you priests. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Listen, you priests. This command is for you. Exclamation point. Why the intensity? As goes the leadership You know, as goes the shepherd, goes the sheep. As go the parent, goes the child in most cases, right? He says this in verse 2. Listen to me and read it with me. Make up your minds. Make up your mind. I love that. Hey, let's have a little fun again in church. Look at the person next to you and say to them, make up your mind on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Make up your mind. This is what God says to the leadership. Listen to me. Make up your minds to honor my name, says the Lord of heaven's armies, or I will bring, now listen, a terrible curse against you. I will curse you even, I will curse even the blessings you receive. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you have not taken my warning to heart. Womp, womp, right? I mean, isn't this a pick-me-upper today? Before we go on, we need to put it in park right here, and we really need to digest and look deeply into what God, our Father, which are in heaven, right? God is God. He is the authority. Um, uh, What he's saying here, because it's really funny how, how people start pushing back on the, the holiness, the justice, the righteousness, the chastisement and discipline of our Father which are in heaven. Listen, I'm talking about the same people who take, a, who take their kids' electronics away when your child, not your child, you know, all the other kids from the other churches. When, when, when somebody's child does something wrong, it's like, oh, give me the electronic. You're not having the electronics for the next 21 weeks, right? Or, or when we ground our children or ground our teenagers because they did something that was wrong. Like, like when we discipline our kids, but when God steps in, 
to start disciplining. Man, we get all riled up, don't we? When the Father steps in to execute justice, to execute discipline, um, we got to, people, some people have a real, real problem with that. We want the unfailing, uh, unconditional, loving God. We don't want a holy, righteous chastisement father. That's not what we want. We want our cake and we want to eat it too. But, but what we're learning in Malachi is he's not only our father which art in heaven, but remember what Malachi chapter one, when we ended the sermon a couple weeks ago, he says, I am a great king. I am in authority here, so don't miss that. Even our kids know when they do something they shouldn't be doing um, that they're going to be disciplined. I, I was at church uh, a couple weekends ago, and, and some of you know uh, Stacy and Matt McCain. They're on the leadership team here at Granite United, and they have a son named Caleb. And Caleb's just a little guy, man. Uh, Caleb uh, was at the church, and, and Caleb had, this is kind of a funny story, he had grabbed some potato chips, and he was in our gymnasium at the Salem campus, and he was crushing the potato chips, making it rain in the gymnasium. Well, the informant, who is his older brother, uh, came to mom to inform her of her other son's misbehavior. And so uh, as, as Caleb was being ratted out by his big brother, Josh, uh, Caleb just walked up to Stacy, and this is classic. He walked up to Stacy and he took his iPhone and he said, before you hear this, you're going to want this. <laughs> he knew right there that he was about to get disciplined because he had done something wrong. Caleb didn't have anything, anything to say other than, yep, did it, guilty, you know, discipline me, take my electronics. So... Hey, in the same way, God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to do things that would harm us or harm others. I want you to know, God's justice and discipline, yes, it cuts. But just like good parents, when it comes to discipline, listen, God doesn't cut to harm. God doesn't discipline to harm. God cuts and disciplines to heal. Did you hear that? That's what he does. God and the word of God, they cut through all the justifications. They cut through all the rationalizations and the excuses with laser beam intensity. Working just like a surgeon who has to cut us open to expose the problem in order to fix a problem. A surgeon doesn't cut to harm. A surgeon cuts to bring healing. And in the same way, when God steps into our lives, it's not because he simply enjoys chastising and disciplining his kids. It's because he loves his children. Just like we love our children, our Father, which art in heaven, wants us to live a life that glorifies God, that results in certain things. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 and 10, the Bible. Somebody say the Bible. The Bible says this. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful for, uh, to you for a little while. Now, this is Paul writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church of Corinth who was living in sin and running in lanes they shouldn't have been running in. And the result, man, there was, there was some really bad stuff going on in the church. And so Paul, the spiritual father of the house, representing our father which art in heaven, sends this letter from God. Now, Paul's just the pen, and he says, listen, I know this hurts you. But verse 9, he says, now I'm glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain, listen to this, caused you to repent and to change your ways. It was a kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you were not harmed by us in any way. In other words, it says, I know it hurt, but the hurt brought some healing. Verse 10. For this kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us, read it with me, church, away from sin. He's like, here's the deal. I had to bring the discipline. I had to bring the chastisement. God had to speak a word through me to you so that you would walk away from sin and result in salvation. Now look at the next part. There's next two words, no regret. 
There's no regret from that kind of sorrow. In other words, listen, you were going down a really dark path and you were heading in a direction that's going to cause hurt and destruction in your life. So I had to step in and say, we don't act that way. We don't do that. Listen, we are working out the salvation that God has put inside of us. We're working it out because God's ways are always the best ways. And so I had to discipline you as a, as a, as a father of the house representing our father with in heaven, God gave, gave me a word to give to you. And it was because he loved you, not because he wanted to hurt you. He wanted healing in your life. And he says, there's no regret with that kind of sorrow. He says, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, changing direction, results in spiritual death, death. And there's so much theology in these two verses, but the point I want us to see is this, that God brings conviction and discipline in our lives for a number of reasons. Number one is this, if you're taking notes and you're filling in the blanks, is this, so that we can know that we're truly saved. Hey, man, that we would know one of the evidence of salvation is this, that God will not allow his children to continue to live in sin. He won't do it. Because Jesus said, I'm going to give you life and give it to you more abundantly because I love you so much. I'm not going to let you run in that lane. I've been where you've been. I see what you see or haven't seen. And I want what's best for you. So you're going to have to trust me. Any parents? Come on, parents. You ever have that conversation with your kid? No, knock it off, buddy. You need to listen to me. I love you, but, but you just don't understand. Listen, one of the evidences of salvation is when we're running in lanes we shouldn't be running in, the Holy Spirit doesn't allow us to get away with that. Number two is this, God wants to eliminate regrets in our life. I mean, we have no regrets. I can tell you this, all my regrets come from not following God and his word. The regrets that I have in my life are when I've gotten away from God's word and I didn't follow God's best plan for my life. I mean, and God's like, I just want to eliminate the regrets. It's like the same thing with our kids, right? No, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want to act that way. If they jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? Just like, knock it off. Listen, you got to play it out. I don't want you to live with regrets. That's what we're teaching our kids in the same way. God's like, I want to eliminate regrets. That's why I, that's why I bring this discipline, not to hurt you, not to harm you. Man, but to set you up, which is a third thing, to position his kids. God wants to position his kids for blessings. And that's why we want our kids to run in a certain lane, right? As parents, as grandparents, why do we speak into our kids' lives? Why do we not let them get away with things that they really want to get away with? Because they don't see what we see, they don't know what we know, and they haven't been where we've been, and we only want what's best for them. And so we don't shy away from stepping into our kids' lives, and it's not to harm. Man, it's to make sure they are set up for blessings, But here's what God said in the opening part of Malachi chapter 2. He says, but when his kids choose, remember, when they make up their minds, they've made up their minds, they were choosing sin over God. Well, God says, I can't let you get away with that. I can't let you run in that lane. I love you too much for that. And so what does he do? Just like us, God steps in. And we don't like these parts of the Bible. We really don't. We understand as physical parents that it is so needful for us when it comes to the realm of parenthood, you know, and every other parent who knows how to better parent other parents' kids, if you know what I'm saying, you know. Uh, Well, if I were their parent, well, you're not. You got more to say grace over than you can handle. So stay in your lane, love your kid, and discipline your kid and set them up for success, okay? But then God steps in, and here's what he says in verse 3, and I know it's heavy. He says, I will punish you and your descendants and splatter, listen to this, splatter your faces with the manure from from your festival sacrifices, and I will throw you on the manure pile. Well, there you go right there. Isn't that awesome? What is that all about? Basically, you made your bed. You're going to have to lie in it. But I will actually step in and I will I will help you through this. But you know what? You're going to feel the pain a little bit. Verse 4. Then at last, listen, then at last you will know it was I who sent this warning so that my covenant with the Levites can continue, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So what does God say there? He says, listen, 
I, I told you not to do it. You did it anyway. I mean, I'm just watching this train wreck happen and allowed you to get to a point in this, it, it, it get to, to, allowed you to get to a point, you know, uh, down the road where all of a sudden you start feel, feeling the pain and the discipline of, you're like, man. And God's like, yeah, uh, all right, didn't feel good, did it? You should have just listened to me at the outset. You should have just taken my word for it. You should have just followed me. And now, look at this. It's a mess. So after looking at chapter 1 and chapter 2, right, we know, that, we know that God doesn't want his kids to run in certain lanes. He wants us to run in a lane that brings blessing, and that blessing is when we run in Father's lane. Why? Because our Father does know what's best for us. So we know what God doesn't want. So what does God ultimately want when it comes to our leadership roles? I'm talking about, you know, two weeks ago we talked about our leadership role, pastors' roles in the church, and then how that, that should have impact you as, as sheep, you know, the shepherd and sheep relationship. And now as leaders in our homes, what does God want? You know, what does he want from our leadership roles in our church, society, and in our homes? Well, I'm glad you asked. Malachi chapter 2 says this, the purpose of my covenant with the Levites, here was the purpose, was to bring it with me, to bring peace, to bring life and peace, to bring life and peace. And that's what I gave them. This required reverence from them. And they greatly revered me and stood in all of my name. Verse 6, they what? Passed on, this is big, they passed on to the people the truth uh, of the instructions they received from me. They did not lie or cheat. They walked with me, living in good and righteous, living good and righteous lives. And they turned many, I love this, they turned many from their, their sins, from, from the lives of sin. Verse 7, the words of a priest's lips should, what? Preserve the knowledge of God and people, what? should go to him for instruction, for the priest is a messenger of the Lord of heaven's armies. There's a lot there. Let me just break it down for you real quick. In verses 5 to 7, God tells us what he desires. He wants a people that will reverence him, a people that will live godly lives, because we reverence him. The, it, you know, our reverence of God impacts our behavior before God and before others. Why? We're the light of the world. We represent the family. You know, that's why we say to our kids, we don't act that way in this house. Hey, buddy, it doesn't matter. Wherever you go, you were taught better than that. It's the same principle with God. He wants us to reverence him so much, that matter, no matter where we're at, who we're with, whether it's in the church, whether it's out in society, or whether it's in our homes, that we reverence God that results in a godly lifestyle. He says in verses 5 through 7, he wants people who obey him, people who receive, now listen, this is a biggie, people who, who will receive his word, but don't miss this, and teach his word. He wants us to receive and teach, okay? He wants us to help others turn and avoid sin. Why would we do that? Because we know that sin takes you further than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay. It makes you poor, pay more than you want to pay. And you know what the end of verse 7 said? It ultimately leads to spiritual death. When we chase after sin, it brings destruction. I'm telling you, physically and spiritually. Even as a, for a Christian, you can suffer loss of reward. But physically speaking, if we chase after sin, it can ruin your marriage. It can ruin your, your, your career. It can ruin your children. It can impact generations to come. And God's like, I don't want that for you. I want more for you. And here's one of the points of, the, uh, of this entire passage. That when leaders made up their mind to choose sin... They were choosing, listen, don't, don't, don't miss this. They were choosing to be brought into father's discipline. Let me just say this. Caleb, Caleb McCain, it's a cute story, but Caleb knew that he was doing something he shouldn't have been doing. He ripped off potato chips from the church, and his dad's got to pay for that. You're going to pay for that, Matt. He took some potato chips from the student center, and then he went and made snow in the, in the gymnasium. And when he chose to do that, when he came before his authority, when he came before mom, he knew. 
He knew he was where he shouldn't have been, doing what he shouldn't have been doing. He knew there was going to be a consequence because his mom loves him too much to allow him to behave that way. So he said, you're going to want this. You're going to want this. I want you to know God loves you. And he cares about each and every one of us. So how does this apply to us? What do we do with it? Well, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to hand this over to our campus pastors. So everybody on every campus on the count of three, put your hands together for your campus pastors. Come on, everybody. Right now, put your hands together. Come on, campus pastors. Come on up here and take over. Hi, campus. Here we are. Hey, I want to land a plane for you a little bit because just like the people that we're talking about in the book of Malachi, we have a choice to make every day. We can choose sin or open and, 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 and choose sin and also choose God's discipline because to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin is what the New Testament says, or, or we can choose to live in obedience to God, living at the word of God, living according to his plan and purposes for our life, and receive, as we read in Malachi 2, life and peace and all that God desires to give his kids. You see, there's another thing you see in the passage here that God has a plan for our homes, for our leadership, right? Um, and, and I want to show that to you. And here's the thing. I want you to know God's way is always the best way. Somebody in the comments say amen. Come on, somebody. His way is always the best way. But what ultimately does God want from our homes? Now, now you may be in a season where, where you're in a season of singleness. I'll talk about that in a minute. You may just be uh, in a marriage and right now not blessed with children. We'll talk about that in a minute. You may have a family. You talk about that. But you may be in a grandparenting stage. But ultimately, what does God want? Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. Here's what God says. He, he's very clear on it. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In the context of marriage, right? Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. We belong to the Lord, uh, to, to the Lord, right? If you're saved, you know it. Type amen in the comments. We belong to the Lord, it says. And in body and spirit, you are his. And what does God want? Somebody type these two words in the comments. What does God want? Godly children. Godly children. God doesn't make any bones about that. He says we, he wants godly children from your union. They're like God brought you together. This, this marriage and this relationship is ordained by God. And one of the purposes of this marriage is that you would bring forth a spiritual heritage. That, that you would be, if you're blessed with children, that your children would not just be good, but they would be godly. That you would bring forth godly children from your union. And then God tells us to do a couple things. He says, so you got to guard your heart. And you need to remain loyal to the wife of your youth. Hey, can I just say this? One of the reasons marriage is under attack in our country is because spiritually, spiritual dysfunctional homes rarely, listen to me, rarely produce children who become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you, I'm not saying in every case, but rarely do spiritually dysfunctional homes produce godly Children, And I know there's a lot there because I know many of you here at Granny United Church, you came to the Lord later on in your years. We live in a mission field here in New England. And let me encourage you with something that God is even where he's still working in your lives. If your children are grown up and you came to Christ after your kids were grown up and now they're making their own decisions. Listen, I want to encourage you just to trust that God is working and stay faithful to Jesus because your kids Man, they're watching, and you may not be where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you used to be, and Jesus Christ is doing a work in your life. So trust God. To those of you who are raising kids and those of us who are in a grandparent stage, listen, there's a couple principles that God gives us in Malachi here. Number one is this, guard your heart. You have to guard your heart because I want you to know the world, the flesh, and the devil's after your heart, after your influence. If he can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. Why? Because he does not want you to develop or have a spiritual heritage. He doesn't want you to build and develop a godly, godly generations to follow in your footsteps. You have to guard your heart. And then he says this, you've got to remain loyal in your marriage. 
You have to invest in your marriage. You have to stay spiritually uh, in physical and spiritual union one with each with another. This is a big deal to God. And some of you are sitting there saying, well, if you're, what if you're in a, se- a season of singleness? Hey, I know that there's a lot of people in our, at Granite that are in this season. And I want to give you two principles. One, guard your heart. Yeah, Guard your heart. Make sure you are seeking as a deer panteth after the water. So I will seek you, God. Seek God. Love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Listen, guard your heart. God has a plan for your life. Trust him. Here's the second thing I'd say to you if you're in a season of singleness. Seek someone who's already loyal. Oh, somebody needs to type that in the comments right now already loyal to Jesus Christ before you find them, before you engage in a relationship with them. Because I've seen it far too often where somebody, oh, they want Jesus because they want you. Find somebody who wants Jesus first, okay? And then add you to the package, if you will. Find somebody who loves Jesus first. Matthew 6, makes it really clear for both of us, no matter what season of life you're in, the Bible says, seek the kingdom of God above all else, guard your heart, stay loyal to Jesus, and live righteously, and he will give us when we go everything you need. Trust him. See, the reason God corrects us when we go off the rails is, is because he knows that generations hang in the balance. Not only you, but generations who come after you hang in the balance. We say this all the time at Granite. You know, uh, people who don't read the Bible read the people who read the Bible. And this goes especially for our kids. They're watching us. Your children, your grandchildren are watching us. They're watching how we respond to situations and how we pray, how we serve, how we bless others, how we talk to people. Our kids are making decisions about their faith based on our lives. Did you hear that? Our children, our grandchildren, they are making decisions. They're making faith-based decisions on how we're living out our faith in front of them. And that's why this is so serious to God. Generations hang in the balance. So as Malachi said, and I want to encourage you, guard your heart. Stay loyal to each other. And most importantly, stay loyal to God. Because God wants to bless us. But when we go off the rails, don't be surprised when your father who are in heaven steps in and says, hey, I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to discipline you not to hurt you, not to harm you, but to bring godly sorrow to you so that you might repent and choose differently. Because I've been where you haven't been. I see what you don't see, and I want what's best for you. And all of this starts when you say yes to Jesus. Hey, you may be joining us today, and you might, not, you might be sitting there saying, I'm not even in a relationship with God. Well, I want you to know he wants to be in a relationship with you. And you say, well, how does that even happen, Pastor? It all starts when you realize that you're a sinner. Now, listen to me. Your sin separates you from God. Your sin has set you up for eternal damnation. Your sin is offensive to a holy God. And God will not allow you into his heaven with sin. You say, well, what do I do? Well, God, the Father, sent his one and only son, Jesus, to the world. And he gave his son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that you and I could have an opportunity in a way to make things right with the Father. And the Bible, somebody type in the comments of the Bible. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I want to ask you a question today. Do you know him? I'm not asking if you know about him. Do you know him? Do a peace in your heart. Do you have peace in your heart? That if today would be your last day on planet Earth, and God forbid I know that, but if it were to be your last day on planet Earth, 
Do you have peace of mind, peace of heart, to, that you know that your very first breath in eternity won't be in hell, but it will be in the presence of God? If you don't know that, the Bible says again, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, meaning God, through his son, Jesus, wants to give you a clean heart and a brand new start, but you need to ask him. If you've never done that, I want to help you do that. The Bible says when we call on his name. So I'm going to help you and I want to lead you in a prayer. And prayer is just talking to God. Don't overcomplicate this. I want you to pray something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I'll pray that to the Lord. You're not just echoing my words. You're talking to God. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm asking you right now to forgive me of my sins. Lord, I know my sin offends you. And God, I know I am a sinner. And so again, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, I'm asking you to give me a clean heart and a brand new start. I'm asking you, Jesus, to bring me back into the Father's family because today I say yes. Today I surrender. I step away from religion. And today I'm starting this relationship. So thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me back into the Father's family. And from this day going forward, I will follow you in Jesus' name. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. I want you to do two things for me. Number one, I just want you to put a little hand emoji in the comments, whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook, no matter where you're following us today, little hand emoji. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to take a screenshot of this link. And after we're done here, I want you to go to the link and fill out the information so that we can reach out to you, congratulate you, and send you some information on what this Christian life journey is all about. The last thing I want to say is, hey, I campus, we got Easter coming up, and I want to encourage you just to go to grandunited.com and grab some of those um, electronic digital invites. Uh, if they're not there today, they'll be there soon, and just uh, download them or go to our Facebook page and just start sharing. Um, and inviting people to our Easter service. Invite your family and friends to join you for Easter right here on the I campus. God is going to work. We're going to have a hope party on Easter weekend. It's going to be amazing because hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. I love you guys. Looking forward to what God is going to do in our church the next few weeks and through Easter. And I look forward to seeing you Tuesday night on Facebook Live at 7.05. God bless and have a great day.